And now, does Google have too much power? The United States government thinks so. A high-stakes legal battle is taking place right now between the U.S. and the tech giant. Columbia law professor Tim Wu breaks it all down with Hari Srinivasan now. Christian, thanks. Tim Wu, thanks so much for joining us. So last week, a pretty big case kicked off. It's the United States versus Google about antitrust issues, something you are an expert on. Kind of break this down for our audience. What's at the center of this case? Uh, the center of this case, the big uh, case against Google, um, first big antitrust case in the last 20 years uh, for a monopolization uh, claim. And at the core is the argument that Google has been maintaining its monopoly over general search using a, a number of uh, agreements and other techniques. And so what are those agreements? What are those techniques that they've been doing that scream out antitrust? I think the core of the case revolves around the idea that Google has been spending its money to escape competition, uh, most uh, clearly through a, an agreement uh, to spend $10 billion uh, or more every year uh, uh, with Apple, to give Apple $10 billion or more a year uh, in order to make Google the default uh, search on the iPhone, and also at least the Justice Department alleges to keep Apple out of search. So uh, their argument is without these payoffs, uh, there's other payoffs uh, to Samsung, payoffs to a company named Mozilla, uh, other Android phone companies. Uh, with Without all these payoffs, Google would have faced significantly more competition, but they've been buying their way out of competition. Now, I'm old enough to remember uh, reporting on the last antitrust case against Microsoft. And back then, we had Internet Explorer that was bundled into the Windows operating system. That seemed to be the sort of unfair practice. Um, this, on the other hand, what is the crime in having what Google would call partnerships with companies like Apple and saying, you know what, I'm, I'm giving them money. I mean, this is just a, a deal between two companies. Uh, you know, this case in some ways is a little bit like Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft was worried about losing its monopoly over operating systems, and uh, it used the stick. It threatened anyone who dealt with uh, Netscape, the Navigator, um, all the intermediaries uh, with loss of its operating system. Um, Google has been using the carrot. Uh, the argument the Justice Department makes is they were worried about competition worried about particularly another search engine showing up uh, on mobile and becoming uh, heavily used, uh, worried about Apple going into to search, and decided that they would spend the money um, to try to avoid that. Now, why is that anti-competitive? I, I think uh, the antitrust laws say that you're supposed to stand your ground and fight, particularly if you're a monopolist. It has different rules for the dominant companies than say your you know, local bakery or something that might make a deal with the local croissant maker um, or the local bread maker. You know, Microsoft um, and Google uh, are in a different category of company and they're not supposed to be allowed to spend money to get away from competition. Okay, so one of the things that people are gonna wonder is, is this bad for consumers? Am I using an inferior product? Am I being forced to do something that Otherwise, I wouldn't want to do. No one doubts that they that they uh, came to market with a great product that people love. It's just the spending money to, to stay there that's been the problem. I mean, imagine there was an Apple search, for example. A lot of people like Apple phones, Apple stuff. Um, you know, maybe the Apple search would be a lot more privacy protective than Google. Uh, people like Google, they don't like the fact that they spy on you all the time. So why isn't there a more privacy protective alternative? That's the kind of things that I think the Justice Department is saying uh, would make it would make consumers better off more competition so you know one of the defenses that google has made for quite some time is that look competition is a click away right it doesn't cost the consumer much time to change the default search if that's what they want to do or literally use a browser to go to some other search engine so we couldn't possibly be uh, anti-competitive because we're not constraining the ability of the consumer to use a competitive product it's a good point. In fact, it's one that Google has uh, been uh, using as a defense in this trial. Uh, the Justice Department's uh, response uh, has been to put on the stand a number of behavioral economists who make the point that, you know, Google understood how important the default was, that most people, when a product is shipped with a search engine, never change it. 
you know, whether it's good, bad, and might like, maybe they'd like something more privacy protective. Maybe they, they just never really uh, bother to change it. And so uh, Google knew it. Google was battling for the defaults. If search was only one click away or choice, why were they spending billions and billions of dollars to make sure uh, that people had this thing installed as the default, um, made sure that other companies didn't go into the market. So I think that's the, the response. Um, I won't say it has no appeal, but I think the human psychology suggests that frankly, when we get locked into something, um, we don't want to switch. You know, there's also a question that the judge is gonna have to consider of intent, or did they know what they were doing? And just, I know it's only been in the first week and this is a trial that could take months, but are there any kind of smoking guns? Are there emails? Are there, is there something uh, within Google that shows that they knew that this is what they were carrying out? Yes, I mean, I think that's what has been effective about the Justice Department's presentation. Um, you know, Google has a, has a great image, friendly company. Um, you know, it's a nice, colorful uh, logo and um, an inspiring story, the garage startup. But I think what the Justice Department's uh, case is showing is a kind of different Google, very calculating, a lot of emails that recognize that they're concerned about um, Apple. Naturally, they're, they're very worried. They want to spend this money to try to make sure uh, they don't face serious uh, competitive forces. So I think what you see and what emerges from this trial is a much more calculating Google, a Google that knows what it's doing and knows what it wants to do and has been in some ways um, planning on maintaining dominance all along. You know, I wonder if this case would be different if it was, say, starting a year ago. And why I say that is before kind of the rise of these uh, open AI or these kind of large language models using artificial intelligence. Uh, Google has their own. Microsoft is partnered with a big one named OpenAI. And I wonder if that's not a significant enough threat to the existing search business where Google can say, look, I mean, look at all these people that are using these AI tools. They're not coming to Google or we're trying to, you know, stay competitive. We're kind of the underdog almost here. Yeah, I think uh, it's an important point that AI has uh, become significant and it seems like something, no one knows exactly what is on the horizon. But in my view, that makes the case more important. Um, we have a, an opportunity here for, you know, technological succession. And if there's anything the history of tech suggests is that companies try and prevent the next thing from coming along and replacing them. Now, there's some chance it'll happen naturally, um, but I think we are in a better world where Google is forced to fight fair, where you know the strategy of using defaults, spending uh, tens of billions of dollars to make sure your product is in front of everybody and not other people's is actually more important. Um, scrutiny on mergers, you don't want uh, Google to buy out uh, its greatest and most dangerous competitors. Uh, now is the time, in fact, for enhanced scrutiny. Um, you know, one of the important things about the Microsoft trial back in the 90s is that it came at a point where Microsoft was facing incredible competitive pressure. And in fact, it created a lot of room for companies like Google to emerge uh, because Microsoft was, was handcuffed, was uh, under a consent decree, and had just been beaten up by the Justice Department for five years. So I think in these moments of technological succession, it's very important that companies feel pressure from the government to fight fair. And that's why I think the timing actually of AI makes this more important that we have this case now. So what does the government have to prove to the judge? I mean, it's a bench trial. There's not a jury here. What do they have to say, all right, this is our case, open and shut. What does the judge have to completely understand? Uh, they have to prove two things. First, that uh, Google had a monopoly over general search, which I think uh, they should be able to prove. And second, uh, to prove that uh, Google used its monopoly uh, to maintain its position, used its economic power to maintain its position. Um, and I think that's the more challenging question. You know, there's a large jurisprudence as to what exactly it means to effectively fight unfair versus fight fair. And as you said, Google will just say, look, we made a good product, people liked it. And the core of the Justice Department's case will be, you had a monopoly, you maintained your monopoly, 
uh, by making deals to keep competitors out. Um, I think the strongest uh, argument in that sort of on the street kind of argument uh, is the idea that they paid Apple in particular uh, to uh, stay out, to not develop itself into a search. Uh, Apple was, was starting to handle um, search traffic. Google said, listen, if you still want this money, you need to stay out. And I think that doesn't sound like fair competition to me. What is Google's defense going to be in this case? What, are, what have they said so far? What are they likely to say? You know, I, I think their defense uh, is, is straightforward. Um, people like our product because we have a better product. Uh, given a choice, over and over, we've seen that people choose Google over Bing, over DuckDuckGo. So it's really all of our so-called power is really about consumer choice. Um, I think that's the core of their argument, that nothing else matters. And if people really wanted to switch, they would have switched. So what are the remedies that the judge could hand down? Let's say the government makes its case and proves those two things. What can the judge, what, what kind of power does the judge have? Uh, you know, the, pow the, the judge has the, the power in equity, at least traditionally, uh, to go as far as to break Google up um, or cause it to divest or uh, parts of Google. Um, at an extreme, it could ask it to divest, i.e. sell the Chrome browser, sell the Android operating system. Those would be strong remedies, uh, kind of a mini breakup. Um, at lesser degrees of intensity, it could ask uh, Google to stop doing deals like this. It could put it in some ways under parole. Um, traditionally, uh, or at least in other cases, the justice or the judges have ordered companies to stay out of certain businesses. It might be weird to order Google to stay out of AI search or something, but um, things like that have been done. AT&T was ordered to stay out of computing in 1956, which had enormous consequences for all of computing, obviously. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a large range. It's a, it's, a, it's a court of equity. And if the Justice Department wins, I think um, it'll be a very interesting and hard question to figure out what the right remedy is. You know, when you talk about uh, antitrust cases going back into, say, the AT&T days back in the 80s, what was the consequence of breaking up a big company like this? I mean, what were the things that consumers felt? What were the things that businesses felt? How did the ecosystem or landscape change if uh, Google is to be broken up or a Microsoft or anybody else in the tech space? What do we know from history that happens? Yeah, it's a good question because we've been down this route before, uh, frankly, starting in the 50s uh, with initial antitrust cases against then IBM, uh, AT&T, and a company called RCA. Um, in the 70s and 80s, IBM, AT&T, again, leading to that AT&T breakup. The 90s uh, with Microsoft. Um, and now we're in the current generation. It's not just Google. There's also a significant case against Facebook seeking a breakup and um, another big Google advertising case. So we're in something, we're in a repeat of something that has happened every 20 or 30 years or so. I would say, looking at history, uh, the short-term consequence has been chaos um, and uncertainty, uh, but the long-term consequence has almost always been a big jump in technological development and the birth of new companies and new industries. It kind of stirs the pot. Um, you know, monopolies have their uh, positive features. Um, they're very familiar, and um, often they have uh, strong research laboratories. But they have a tendency, unsurprisingly, towards stagnation. Uh, they usually have an existing business model that they don't want to uh, cannibalize. Um, you know, you take Google right now. Um, one of the challenges with AI for it is it challenges the advertising model that it's at the core of Google. So something emerging that somehow isn't quite that model for them is very, very dangerous. Um, AT&T was always concerned about the rise of an internet, or what later became known as the internet, that it didn't control. That is, businesses that were on top of the phone lines. AT&T wanted everything to be operated by AT&T. That was their way of doing business. And if, uh, I don't know, if people are old enough to really remember AT&T, at its, at its glory days, but it controlled everything. The phones were sold by AT&T, Western Electric. The um, long distance service was AT&T, local service, everything had to be AT&T business services. So 
you know, long story short, uh, it makes a lot of room for other companies. It has jump-started some of the most important computer revolutions, antitrust breakups and antitrust attacks, including software industries, the internet industries. Frankly, the American economy would not look the way it does without some of the big antitrust cases we've had. And um, so, you know, it's obviously too early to say whether the current attack on big tech will have similar effects, but if history is any guide, um, relaxing the grip of the monopolist usually leads in good directions. Given the amount of money that large tech companies are able to spend lobbying the legislative branch, certainly, it has been uh, really difficult to try and get what might be common sense measures about privacy or antitrust further down the road, even when there's some bipartisan agreement on these things. So is there actual possibility here that what this judge decides on Google can do what Congress doesn't seem to be able to? Uh, I guess I'd say yes and no. Uh, first, I will agree with your sentiments that passing what seemed like very obvious pieces of legislation, privacy, children's privacy, uh, has been almost impossible in ways that are frustrating, embarrassing, frankly shameful for this country. Uh, you know, who you would think that Congress, anyone in Congress would be opposed to better privacy for children, uh, but we couldn't get it done. Um, I was in the government uh, until uh, earlier this year, and we just could not get things through Congress. So you're right about that. Um, Fortunately, in the United States, we have courts as well as Congress, and we have Justice Department and independent prosecution. And I think that is ending up uh, being very important. Uh, you know, the influence of large companies over the legislature is well known, well documented, and makes certain things almost impossible. Um, but uh, I would say that Justice Department uh, and the courts are just less, uh, you know, you can hire extremely good lawyers, um, you can try and influence them, but they have a certain level of independence and have always had a level of independence. They've had a tradition of taking on the biggest monopolists ever at the antitrust division and justice. And I think that's very important, frankly, for American democracy. Tim Wu, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having me on.